Rick is going to present a slightly uh, different perspective on this, and his topic is a little more complicated than just cyber war. He'll be talking about cyber peace. And yes, he knows how to spell. Okay, quiet everybody, we're starting. Quiet, please. Good afternoon. Do I have your attention? No? Hello. Good afternoon. That's right. Look up from your monitor. Press save on that email. I've actually got an interesting topic that's interesting for me because I don't know what I'm talking about. And I need some help. I need some help in this. Um, cyber warfare is a, a topic that has been uh, gaining a lot of traction in the last year or so. A number of activities have, or engagements, as the military historians would like to say, um, have created a situation where we're talking about cyber war more than we are about peace. Now, I come from a background of farming, and this comes from my farm in uh, Richmond, California, where we, we grow a bunch of vegetables, and uh, my wife runs a, a business where we, we grow uh, 400 varieties of heirloom veggie plants, starts, and sell them to garden centers. And for a number of years, she's been running this business, and recently we moved out to the farm. I moved all of my stuff out to the farm. I run a a little cybersecurity company that came from uh, San Francisco. And I learned some things by hanging out on a farm with animals and chickens and ducks and sheep and plants. And I wanted to see if we could talk a little bit about how cybersecurity is like a lot of other things. Cybersecurity is something that you guys have been selling, that you sell collectively. A lot of you work for, for companies that are trying to, to secure the world. And unfortunately, I was labeled as a, a combatant in a book by Mark Bowden called The First Digital War where he described this activity against uh, Conficker, which was a, a worm that came before Stuxnet. And it was when Mark wrote this book and how he couched a lot of the language in the book all around military activity, where the title of this book should have been Three Fat Men Typing. He got this, you know, I guess you need a little, it's gotta be titillating to sell. And, um, you know, it was an incredibly interesting activity what we did with Conficker, and I lost an enormous amount of money in it, but I also got a lot of access into DOD from it, and I learned that that wasn't exactly where I wanted to be, and that being a hippie and, and growing food was more fun. Um, I like the philosophical discussion, and that's what led me to this idea of what is cyber peace? And why is, it not discuss why is it not a track at RSA? And why is it not uh, on all of the agendas of the different cybersecurity companies? And the reason is because you cannot sell cyber peace. You can't sell it. There is nothing to buy. There is nothing to sell. And it's just a giant morass of misunderstanding. So I thought by doing talks like this that It'll, it'll create a dialogue, and from that dialogue, I will learn things. And I have learned by failing more than you can imagine. And, and I hope that it, it, it doesn't take too long today. It's merely a 30-minute talk. Um, asymmetric warfare, I've learned, goes back a really long time. And when we started uh, gardening out in Richmond, California, I started seeing these same situations that were presented in the digital realm and thinking, you know, this film, it feels familiar. What, what kind of language do they use to talk about uh, this situation? And how are things similar? So if we look at corn growers, people that grow maize in, in uh, agricultural situations all over the world, big, giant industrial farms, we grow ass loads, which is actually a technical term, of corn 
in the United States. And a lot of it is due to this thing called Roundup, which is glycophosphate. And what Roundup allows you to do is to kill all these kinds of plants. Well, the problem is, is Roundup actually kills corn. And so what these folks at Monsanto did was they figured out how to insert a gene into the corn plant to keep Roundup from killing it. Now this was fantastic. It allowed enormous amounts of gains in the uh, bushels of corn you could get. So you've got this monoculture like we have in cyberspace. You have a monoculture and it can be attacked by one thing. And so by uh, creating a special strain that includes this new strength, then uh, Roundup can be applied to this, uh, to this corn, and it kills everything but the corn, which makes it awesome for the farmers. Well, it turns out there's a lot of other uh, distracting things for these farmers in that some of these genes trade places, and some of the, the pests, uh, in, in, um, they adapt after a couple of years. It's really pretty interesting from a biological perspective on how quickly biology adapts to the changes that humans make. It's, it's really quite stunning and it does this on a global scale. And so being an organic farmer, we can't use these kinds of tricks. And we have to learn how to grow ladybugs. And you're like, grow a ladybug? Well, a ladybug eats a, you know, this other bug. And then if you have a lot of these other bugs, then you, you don't have the, the bug that is going to eat your crop, which is an aphid if you're growing tomatoes. And so I started thinking about this, you know, how in the digital realm can we, um, can we create these kinds of things that are like ladybugs, they're beneficial, they don't hurt the environment, they actually help, and um, they help us to our goal, which is to bring to market a quality organic vegetable that doesn't use glycophosphate. You say, why would you not want to use glycophosphate? Well, um, one of the things that made my wife change her mind about organic farming was when she was a pesticide applicator at the age of 19, having not graduated high school. Um, she was out in the fields applying mass quantities of these uh, glycophosphates along with her peers. And when her peers got pregnant and had children that had genetic defects that are linked to these chemicals, it just made her stop in her tracks. She was like, what the, what, what the fuck am I doing? I cannot... I cannot be a part of this situation. And, you know, it's complicated. Most of us never passed chemistry. A significant portion of us enjoy math and don't like to go outside. So you would never see this kind of, of uh, activity from where you sit inside. And this is something that I've really enjoyed on spending my time out in the farm is understanding where things like this come from. They, these are, are pollen grains. This is the part of sex that happens. Yeah, sex was invented a really long time ago by plants to propagate very close individuals. It's not perfect copies. Just like we have today with a few thousand strains of malware and literally hundreds of millions of variants of that same capability. Nature's been doing this for a really long time, and it's also designed a whole bunch of things to encourage or discourage the activity. And so we find the asymmetrical situation or asymmetrical warfare, as the folks um, like to classify the situation that we're in today. Um, and there's a number of different tactical advantages that one could have, either in the biological plant world or on the network. The technological advantage is one that we like in meat space in our current military. We spend an enormous amount of money developing technology so that we have technical supre superiority over our adversary. There's numbers. Numbers were used for a really long time, and the people that we're really worried about have giant numbers, right? They have a billion citizens versus our 350 million. When India had a power outage, it affected twice the number of people that we have in our nation last summer. It was like our entire nation going out. And so uh, there's a numerical advantage that you can have in asymmetrical warfare. And everyone is always looking for an asymmetrical advantage because it has the multiple, just like in our financial system. You're looking for a multiple. Oh, this is what you, you weren't telling me I needed to have a blowjob. It was, 
that I needed to hold the microphone close. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Um, there's uh, an advantage in having uh, a better capability over your uh, command and control, or you can obtain this through higher advantages of training. Um, there's this uh, Latin term, jus ad bellum, which is the laws of war. And this is where the bulk of the rest of my talk is going to head, in that we have no laws of war on cyberspace today. What we have is a complete open blank field that is, or blue sky, that is being leveraged by everyone that has the capability to do it. Um, the advantage that I believe that the technologists have here in the room would be a terrain advantage. We understand technology far better than most people, and ideally, we can position ourselves to take advantage of this situation. So when military folks are trying to think about cyberspace, like the, the guy that's uh, running Cyber Command, he likes to talk to a bunch of other military historians and ask, you know, what is cyberspace? And they say, well, you know, if we look at the maritime regime, and maritime uh, it could be a proxy for how we deal with cyberspace. And there was this whole law that was developed, a set of laws over maritime uh, development and cyberspace, we can apply some of those things. And so one of the first things I tried to get through a number of uh, contacts with the House of Representatives was a letter of mark. And I wanted a letter of mark so that I could take all of those conficker drones and fix them without asking. And so what I was told was that I would be put in jail if we tried to fix all of the drones without them asking because that was illegal and that only a letter of mark would allow me to do this. And so I learned about letters of mark, which were instruments that kings in Europe used to encourage privateers, people that would take their boats, get some capital, and go out onto the sea and fight a proxy war for the king. And this was done by Spain and England and a number of different countries. And at the time I was trying to, to get a letter of mark, I was trying to understand, is this a good idea? Can I go out and fight proxy battles for my state? And are there other people in other nations going about this in, in the same way? And it turns out that there was no way uh, a letter of mark would have to be an act of Congress. I would have to get it passed both houses of Congress and signed by the president. And I was like, you know, that sounds hard. So and unlikely. So today we have what's called open war and there is a collateral damage. And I think the collateral damage is really around the memes that we use and the dialogue that we, the framework that we try and put all of this stuff into without a clear definition of what cyber peace is. What is the, what is the other side of the coin? What are our options? How do we get to a place that doesn't involve warfare and security? And what, some of the ideas that have been proposed are that we have a lack of norms. We don't have the capability of defining what the individual states are that we accept as uh, reasonable activity on the network. No one has defined that. Well, it turns out in warfare, we go back a few hundred years and those definitions were made. And they were made because people were concerned about the capabilities of the technology that they had developed. Just like we sit here, other people sat around a table and said, the thing that we have created is evil and we should not allow anyone to use it. And other countries said, we agree with that. We're not going to use that. We're going to define our battle on land under these terms. And so without those declarative norms, from a society that states that these particular activities are out of bounds, we have an escalating arms race on internet time. And so this is a letter of Mark uh, that a king of England wrote uh, to, to this particular captain that went out into um, fight the pirates. It basically allowed them to take all the booty. This is one of the problems with a letter of Mark and there was no booty to get. Like if I go take over a big botnet and I fix the computers, what, do I win anything? Am I gonna get a prize? It's not, there is no win. And so a lot of time was spent, mostly advocated by the intellectual property community to discuss the internet in terms of piracy. 
and pirates and the whole... Who is this fellow? What's his name? I can't even remember the movie. What? Jack Sparrow. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, so... Disney latched onto this, and we ended up with some great fantastic... This is a Lego uh, Jack Sparrow. Um, so at any rate, pirates were a big thing in trying to understand, uh, was that the appropriate meme? And it lasted a few years of dialogue about pirates and how we can, we can understand how pirates were mitigated. You know, what stopped piracy? How did the, how did the, uh, the people that were encouraged to go and fight the pirates. How did that get started? And it turns out it was letters of Mark, and that's not going to go very far. And we still have the MPAA going after piracy and the, the, the theft of software, but that's not cyber war. And so the insurance industry has started to think about the uh, applications of the maritime environment on top of cyberspace. And this is a different exercise in the maritime environment, since 1950s, we've had a very peaceful sea. We haven't had a ship torpedoed probably since 1953. The seas are a very safe place, and they've encouraged these ginormous ships to be built that carry billions of dollars of goods in and out of ports, and this is an awesome activity. States encourage this kind of, of commerce. And, and this is what you get when you don't have war on the open seas. So if we're to look at the maritime environment and try and map it to cyberspace from the perspective of warfare and engagement, what does peace look like? Peace looks like a Panamax. It looks like being able to move property, not intellectual property, but property, atoms, from place to place very easily and very cheap. So this is one way that we could think about peace in the cyber domain is that it creates the opportunity for commerce, investment, and business. So what happens when things fail? Now, when a giant ship loses a bunch of cargo or the ship goes down, and there's a ton of pictures out there of, of, of what happens when big ships that are um, you know, some of these Panamax sized ships hit a bad storm and they lose a bunch of cargo. The thing is, is that is really well defined. And it took about a hundred years to get there. It took about a hundred years for the insurance industry to understand how to insure all this property. And it's physical property. In the digital realm, we have insurance companies that write cyber insurance, but they have no way to quantify whether or not that that's a reasonable policy. They just say, oh, it's not going to be a very big payout. We'll just write the insurance and move forward. And so today, in the cyber insurance world, it's actually a very small amount of money. And uh, there hasn't been a lot of activity where the insurance companies had to pay out. And so as we move to economies that are uh, defined more by internet commerce, internet transactions, understanding how to insure those uh, troves of data that are valuable and can be exfiltrated is valuable to, to making a more peaceful and quiet environment. So the modern rules of war were really started by exploding musket balls. Now, in the 1800s, guns were really new. Like the mass production of guns, we'd figured out how to do that. Uh, we'd been able to make cartridges, but still most armies used musket balls. And in 1863, some Russians had finally developed a musket ball that when it went through a piece of wood would explode. So it hit something hard and the musket ball would explode. And this was really useful for uh, shooting up uh, things that contained ammunition or explosives, and they would use them as um, a, uh, a way to, to explode an ammunition cart. Now, back then, everything was still done with horses. So you were, you were moving these carts around with horses and exploding musket balls. Evidently, some people got shot with exploding musket balls, and the consensus was, that's pretty fucked up. Now, 
what happened, and I think that this is a really interesting piece of military history that we should learn how to internalize. If we want to have a peaceful internet, we should learn from what they did here, was a number of countries got together in St. Petersburg and made a declaration in 1868 that said, we're going to limit the exploding ammunition to above one, uh, 400 grams. And the size of the ammunition, anything smaller than 12.5 millimeters, can't have an exploding capability. And they also said a few years later at the Hague Convention in 1899 that we want to tack on all of these other things about how we deal with prisoners. And it essentially harmonized the laws of war on land. And this was because they thought that war should be fought for very specific reasons and there should be very specific rules that prohibited poison and super superfluous injury. I'm merely stating that to think about cyber peace, we need to internalize these ideas and regurgitate them for the age that we live in with a network world to define what is the superfluous, can't even say the word after two beers, injury and understand what the war on or in cyberspace is acceptable. And I think that you are the people that can do this. So it started with an exploding bullet and it ended with the Geneva Convention. The rules on if you're captured as a prisoner, what happens to you? The rules that you have to be fed, that you have to be housed, that you cannot be shot with exploding ammunition unless it is of a certain size. We haven't done this in cyberspace. And I think that it needs to be done. In cyber war, a lot of us look at espionage and identify the corporate espionage that's happening. And I am agreeing that that has to be off the table. That is not the kind of, of activity that I am suggesting is a war-making activity. But as assets continue to be virtualized, such as the currencies, Bitcoin and PP coin, as intellectual property is transmitted around the network and becomes a unit, a unit of work, much like a unit of property is on a container ship, as organizations amass identity, that these assets, as they're virtualized, become a target. They are a part of the non-classified espionage, not so much as war making. But there is activities, there have been activities that have a kinetic effect. And um, I think that there are three really good examples. One starting with Estonia, where we moved, not we, but we, that there was a statue that was moved and the kinetic effect from the internet attack on a society that was highly integrated with the network was enough that the government <laughs> believed that they could have lost the government. And that's really important. If a government can lose control of their people because of activity that happens on the network, well, holy shit, we better pay attention to the network. The second was in Georgia where the Russians leveraged kinetic and internet and political attacks. The third, which I believe was leveraged against um, one of our opponents, was Stuxnet, which had the effect without the bomb. I think it was that moment where they realized that you could affect something kinetically over the network and that value of not having anything explode, no loss of life, no loss of property, loss of capability was a key event in many military historians' perspective of what cyber war is going to be. It's about affecting without killing or changing any 
atoms. You affect a capability. So if that's what war is, what's, what's peace? Well, we can say it's the lack of war, but that's not really helpful. We can look at maritime trade or the maritime peace that's happened over the last 40 years and if it's reasonable to use the internet as a proxy for the maritime domain or vice versa, then trade would be the benefit of having a peaceful internet. And we get to create big things of internet data that are valuable, like Wikipedia and Google and all of the other assets that some of you work for. I think one of the big effects of trying to define what cyber peace is is to come up with what the societal norms are, just like what was done in The Hague, when a number of organizations and the, pe the very people that invented the exploding musket balls said this should not be used, that we have a moral right to define these things and get other people to agree to them. And I think that is where we should go, is in setting of societal norms. So this is one of the big things that happened from having a peaceful maritime environment was that we standardized what trade came in. Little packets of atoms. They're 40 feet long or they're 20 feet long. And that was it. This is also my data center out at the farm. I think that commerce has the potential to be a goal for a peaceful internet, for something that doesn't have warfare on it. I don't have kids, so I don't have any real reason to build something for the future, but maybe you do. In The Hague, in 1899, they defined what the rules engagement for land war were. The WCTI recently closed uh, this was an ITU effort in Dubai. It started on the 3rd. It was essentially a negotiation of what the Internet is going to be for the ITU member countries. And a lot of it is this debate between ICANN and the ITU on how the Internet is going to operate. And the biggest news to come out of this particular effort is that through deep packet inspection, at a national level, globally, we can solve problems. That is not the kind of environment that creates freedom or passion for freedom. So what I believe we need to do is from the bottom up, not from the top down, where you have to be a country to participate in Wicket, is to declare what is acceptable. What is our version of this little exploding small arms ammunition that we're going to define as unacceptable and write some rules around? And using bottom-up definitions from people like you, not politicians or plurocrats. And so with that, I'll invite you to the first annual conference on internet peace, which will be held at my farm in just under a year, in November. 29th, 2013. And so with that, I'll take your questions. Check, check. Any question? Uh, you, uh, you look at actors. Uh, you're, you're making similes to actors uh, in war as being nations. But in, in the cyber threats, the actions of war are individuals that are anonymous. How are you going to hold anonymous individuals responsible for their actions the way nations have been held responsible in the past? So his question is, how do we hold anonymous actors accountable for their actions? Because it's difficult in our domain to understand who the actors are. And in war, we understand who the actors are. And they can be held accountable. And so, I don't have an answer for your question. I can say that that's a, a difficult problem. Anonymity is something that we've struggled with on the network for a long time. But I don't think it, there's a, 
there's any hope on solving the anonymity problem. And maybe what we'll have is a different mechanism for accountability without identity. That would be where I would start to look. Anyone else? Question in the back. Hi. Uh, wow, this one works really well. Uh, so I like the um, analogy to maritime trade. Yeah, we've had um, many pirate attacks around Somalia, and those didn't mitigate until governments became involved. Is that a one? If so, what can we do? So Somalia is one of 250 nation states that is considered a failed state. They don't have the resources to police their own seas. They don't have the resources to police their own citizens. And in that situation, we have uh, the citizens have banded together to take over ships. And it wasn't until other nations that had navies to come out and, and police those waters. So I think that that's a situation where we have piracy is in a failed state. We also have small time piracy in uh, the straits around Indonesia. There are pirates and you can have your ship lost. I believe there's been incidences in um, off the coast of Cuba or some of the other islands in the Bahamas where ships have been lost due to you know, more recent piracy. But I don't think that piracy from uh, the situation back in the 1800s where we created, let or letters of mark were created as a mechanism to deal with pirates and to deal with other navies. I don't see that, uh, that the maritime meme for mapping piracy to the internet works. I think where maritime situations apply to the internet is around the peaceful side or situation. What happens when this entire domain is available to everyone in a safe and secure situation? I would disagree with that, but we can talk after this. All right, you buy the first beer. I've got tickets, we're good. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, okay, so hey, thanks for, um, for letting me come here and, and talk to you about cyber peace. I appreciate it. And uh, in the meantime, over the next day or so, I, I'd appreciate feedback and ideas that you have. This isn't something that I feel like I've really settled on, and um, I'm interested in, in your thoughts. So. Hey, guys, uh, so we have the food already set up. Uh, similar thing as lunch break. Just line up this way and uh, grab some food. Yummy, yummy.